Queen Elizabeth II was the longest reigning monarch in Britain's history. She was famous and infamous around the world. She was not only the Queen of England, but also one of the richest people in the world. However, although living a life in the global public eye, there are surprising facts you perhaps didn't know about Her Majesty. From her own tartan design to a spectacular car collection, here are 20 expensive things Queen Elizabeth owns. Number 20. Buckingham Palace Inside Queen Elizabeth's $5 billion Buckingham Palace, located in the city of Westminster in central London, this place is what you would expect from the official London residence of the monarch of one of the most powerful countries in the world. Buckingham Palace is synonymous with tasteful luxury, splendor, and magnificence. Since Queen Elizabeth died, Buckingham Palace is currently home to His Majesty the King of England, King Charles III. In fact, Buckingham Palace is one of the very few working royal palaces remaining in the world today, since many countries have replaced their monarchies for full democracies. At the heart of the palace, you can find the 19 staterooms, which can be visited on very selected dates from November to December and at Easter. These spectacular rooms are decorated with some of the most refined and greatest treasures from the royal collection, including paintings by masters such as Rembrandt, Rubens, Canaletto, and Van Dyck, sculptures by Canova, Severus Porcelain, and some of the very finest English and French furniture in the entire world. Perhaps the grandest of all the staterooms rooms is the White Drawing Room, which serves as a royal reception room for the monarch and members of the royal family to gather before official occasions. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button and click the notification bell right now or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. Queen Victoria's Wedding Dress. Queen Victoria of England married Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha on February 10th, 1840. For the occasion, she wore a wedding dress designed by William Dice, director of the Government School of Design, future Royal College of Art, and made by Mary Bettens. Victoria chose a simple white dress with a pleated skirt of thick silk satin. The choice of white was considered very conservative at a time when colors were the norm, especially since the Queen wore very little jewelry, no velvet, no ermine fur and not even a crown. The Honiton lace used for the dress energized Devon lace making and influenced the dress of later royal weddings. Although Queen Victoria was not the first bride to marry in white, the long-lived tradition of the white wedding dress is largely attributed to her. Wearing white quickly became fashionable among wealthy brides after Victoria's wedding. It symbolizes the purity and innocence of the young girl and the pure heart she offers to her chosen one. So, if yourself or anyone you know got married in white, this dress is the reason why. It became the most influential wedding gown in history, and it's now in the possession of the Royal Collection Trust. Number 18. 200 Lawner Handbags It is no secret that Queen Elizabeth II knew how to accessorize. She could be, in a way, considered a fashion influencer. You'd be hard-pressed to find a picture of the monarch without one of her signature Lawner handbags. In fact, she reportedly owned over 200 of them. But as it turns out, her iconic handbags were used for much more than a simple fashion statement. Her Majesty used them to send secret messages to her staff. These subtle signals helped her to get out of conversations anytime she pleased. For instance, if the Queen moved her handbag from its normal spot on her left arm to her right arm while talking to someone, her handlers knew it was time to wrap things up and they would come up with an excuse for her to leave. If the monarch put the handbag on the floor, it meant she needed to be saved from an awkward encounter ASAP. And if she was at dinner and placed her lawner on the table, it meant the event had had to be done with in the next five minutes, and again, her team would have to come up with a reason or excuse for her to leave immediately. God, life would be so much easier if we all had a team of handlers to get us out of uncomfortable conversations, don't you think? Number 17. 
Race Horses Horse racing and the royal family have a relationship that goes back to when the sport was actually invented. So yeah, it's fair to say that the British royal family enjoys horse racing. The royals have kept horses for generations and many reasons, but it was King George IV that gave particular promotion to the sport in the 1800s. Over time, stables that previously bred horses for combat and transport turned into breeding grounds for racehorses. Today, such stables can be found all over the United Kingdom and Ireland, and one of the most elite ones is the Queen's Sandringham Estate. In fact, some of the Queen's thoroughbred horses have won some of the most prestigious and biggest races in the sport. With names as famous as Carroza or Estimate, the Monarch stable has produced some spectacular champions over the years. But how many racehorses did Her Majesty actually own? Well, calculating the exact number is rather tricky, especially considering that new blood was added to her stables every year. But to put things into perspective, in 2021, the Queen's horses ran 166 times during the flat season alone. This means she owns well over 100 horses, and she's believed to have earned an estimate of of 7 million pounds from prize money over the years. Number 16. Wimbledon's Royal Box Wimbledon is probably the most prestigious event for tennis across the world. It's certainly the most renowned. With such status, it's only natural that the British royal family shall be attracted to the event. And how else to watch a tennis match rather than in a private, separated, and guarded royal box? The royal box at Wimbledon was established in 1922 as a place for the British royal family to entertain other foreign dignitaries, members of the armed forces, or celebrities of their choice as they watched the world world's best tennis players in action. Being the queen and all, you may think that she was the one who decided who got to sit on the 74 dark green Lloyd Loom wicker chairs, but no. In fact, the chairman of the All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club is the one who has the power to give away the invitations. All guests of the Royal Box also get free access to the clubhouse for refreshments and lunch, and they even get treated to goodie bags at their seats. As you can imagine, it's not possible to pay your way into the Royal Box. One can only be invited, and to do so must be a very important person. Number 15. Real Estate According to Business Insider, Queen Elizabeth II had a net worth of 442.92 million US dollars or 340 million pounds. After her death, all her assets and fortune were set to be passed down to her son, King Charles III. Her fortune is vastly larger than any other member of the royal family, including the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, who have a shared net worth of 30 million US dollars. Although technically, all of the Queen's assets don't actually belong to her they belong to the royal firm, also known as Monarchy PLC. No monarch has the right to sell any of said assets to make a profit, and yeah, this includes the palaces. According to Forbes, the crown, through Monarchy PLC, holds almost 28 billion US dollars in assets. These include the Crown Estate, valued at $19.5 billion, Buckingham Palace, worth an estimated $4.9 billion, the Duchy of Cornwall, worth $1.3 billion, the Duchy of Lancaster, valued at $748 million, Kensington Palace, estimated to be worth $630 million, and finally, the Crown Estate of Scotland, valued at $592 million. The Crown Estate is a corporation that manages a collection of properties and lands that belong to the reigning sovereign. The business of the Crown Estate generates a lot of money. Over the last decade alone, it has contributed $2.6 billion for the government. Number 14. Queen Victoria's Sketchbooks Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, took on the lease of the Balmoral Estate in 1848 and were finally able to purchase it in 1851. After that, the old castle was demolished and a new one built in its place. They both loved this place quite a lot and would travel here regularly. During her many visits to Balmoral, Her Majesty was able to sketch on an almost daily basis. Year after year, she would return to her favorite spots all over the estate armed with her paint box and sketchbooks. 
Her drawings act as a visual parallel to her written journals, where she explored her inner thoughts. The fact that these sketches are fairly small in size suggests that they were for the Queen's personal enjoyment only, and never intended to be displayed to the public. It was more like a therapeutic activity for the monarch. You know, as Shakespeare said, heavy is the head that wears the crown. In fact, the Queen wasn't a bad sketcher. On the contrary, her aquarelles are quite tasteful and the color palette rather delicate. Today, her artwork is owned by her descendants, the modern royal family. Number 13. Biggest Landowner if you thought that the Queen's palaces were impressive, you'll be floored when you learn that Elizabeth held the title to roughly 6.6 .6 billion acres of land throughout the world. Yeah, it seems like too much land for just one tiny little person, right? To put things into perspective, that's about one-sixth of the land of the whole planet. This made Elizabeth one of the largest landowners in the whole world. Her one-sixth of the earth falls under the Crown Estate, which essentially operates as a real estate business. All the profits of the firm go to the United Kingdom's treasury, but Her Majesty did receive 15% of the profits, so she was well set, to say the least. Most people don't know this, but her holdings also included most of the United Kingdom's seabed, out to 12 nautical miles from the shore. Basically, she owned all the land that circles the United Kingdom. That's a lot, and as it seems, that's very bad news to conservation work. The royal family has a tendency to slow down efforts to restore coastal waters. Most recently, they derailed the largest effort to replant seagrass ever undertaken in Britain. When seagrass thrives, it protects against coastal erosion, serves as nurseries to coastal marine life, and absorbs huge amounts of carbon. What's the point of owning so much land if they are not going to preserve it? Number 12. Swans, Dolphins, Whales, and Sturgeons We all know that King Charles III is set to receive a huge inheritance from both the crown and his mother's private estate. No surprise there. But some of the assets he will inherit are a little, uh, let's say, unexpected. While his inheritance includes the usual entities that define the royal family, such as the Duchy of Lancaster Estate and the Queen's pricey and extensive jewel collection, it also includes 32,000 swans and an unidentified number of whales, dolphins, and sturgeons. Contrary to popular belief, the Queen did not own all the swans in the United Kingdom, but she did own a buttload of them. This long link between the British royal family and swans dates back to the 12th century, when they established ownership over the species to save it from poachers. Since then, swans have become one of many royal symbolic properties, and as part of her duties, the Queen oversaw the annual Swan Upping event, which is a census of the swan population on the River Thames. Whales and dolphins officially came under the ownership of the crown in the year 1324, all thanks to a rather absurd and obscure statute that states they are considered as fishes royal. This statute was later expanded to include sturgeons and porpoises. Number 11. Jewelry Collection it was no secret that the Queen enjoyed buying and wearing the most refined and expensive jewelry out there. Whether it was a dazzling diamond tiara or the simple pair of pearl earrings she'd never seemed to leave the palace without, Queen Elizabeth II always made a fashion and status statement with her jewelry pieces. Some of her pieces are incredibly expensive. The Cullinan 3 and 4 brooch alone is estimated at a staggering 50 million pounds, which is approximately 58 million dollars. She also owned a spectacular private collection of gems. Her royal jewelry box is worth millions. After her death, you would think that her collection would pass on to her son, King Charles III, but it would seem the issue isn't as clear-cut as her diamonds. The truth is, there isn't much detail out there about the ownership of all the royal jewels. Royal wills are sealed, so the public can't really go looking for those documents for guidance. But most likely, the Queen has followed in the footsteps of her mother, Queen Elizabeth Queen Mother, and her grandmother, Queen Mary, and bequeathed the entirety of her jewel collection directly to the new monarch her son. Number 10. Royal Corgis The Queen loved animals, that was clear, and in particular dogs, and in particular corgis. In fact, 
Queen Elizabeth II owned over 30 corgis from her ascension to the throne in 1952 until her recent death in 2022. She owned at least one corgi throughout the years 1933 to 2018. How's that for fondness of corgis? The royal corgis, being so cute and adorable, were globally publicized. They were even featured on the cover of Vanity Fair's Summer 2016 edition. I don't think there are that many dogs that can say they were on a magazine cover. They left a vast legacy after death, having been depicted in various statues, professional photographs, paintings, and even stuffed animals you can buy at the gift shop at Buckingham Palace. When she died, Queen Elizabeth II left behind at least four dogs, of which two are corgis. One is a cocker spaniel and the other is a dorgy, a dachshund corgi hybrid that she is credited in originating. Their respective names are Muick, Sandy, Lissy, and Candy. But her first ever corgi was gifted to her on her 18th birthday. It was a female puppy named Susan. Susan was, in her own way, also a queen mother, seeing as all the corgis bred by the queen since are descendants of Susan. Number 9. Guinness World Records Did you know that Queen Elizabeth II was a Guinness Book of World Records holder not once, not twice, but seven times over? Well, she was. But what kind of records did the monarch hold? Well, it would seem the head of the Commonwealth and the Defender of Faith held the record for the longest reigning monarch in Britain's history. That is quite the record. She was on the throne a total of 70 years and 214 days. She also had the record for the oldest British monarch, even surpassing King George III, who ruled until he died at 82 years of age. Consequently, she also held the record for the oldest British queen, a title she stole back in 2017 and that formerly belonged to her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, who ruled until the age of 81 and 244 days. Queen Elizabeth II also held the world record for the most currencies that have featured the same individual's image. Due to the Commonwealth, the Queen's face, or rather her profile in some cases, has appeared in the coinage of at least 45 different countries. In April 2012, when her wealth was estimated at 310 million pounds, she became the wealthiest queen in history. And to top it all off, on June 3, 2012, on the monarch's 60th anniversary as the queen, the Thames Diamond Jubilee pageant took to the River Thames to celebrate. They deployed a total of 670 boats in the queen's honor. This was by far the largest ever parade of boats ever recorded. Number 8. Scotland's Gold Mines Gold has been mined in Scotland for centuries. In fact, there were even two short-lived gold rushes there, except not many movies were made about them featuring dashing Hollywood movie stars. The first gold rush occurred back in 1852 at Ochter and Kinniswood, and the second in 1869 at Kildonan in Sutherland. As early as 1424 and until 1592, under the Royal Mines Act, all of the gold and silver mined in Scotland belonged directly to the crown. So just in case you were wondering why the Scots don't like the Brits that much, it's because of stuff like this. In 1962, King Charles I gave a license to Andrew Huntar of Aberdeen to prospect for precious stones, silver, and gold in the area north of the River Dee. And more recently, Queen Elizabeth II owned all of Scotland's gold mining activities and had a right to sell them too. The mines of these precious metals are known as Mines Royal, which basically means the monarch of England is is the landowner of all the mines in Scotland. Number 7. The World's Largest Clear-Cut Diamond They call it the Great Star of Africa, otherwise known as Cullinan 1, and it is the largest known clear-cut diamond. It's now mounted on the sovereign scepter, but it originally hails from South Africa. Now, you might be wondering what a diamond found in the African continent is doing in a British royal item. Well, you wouldn't be the only one. The original stone was the size of a human heart. Imagine that. It weighed around 3,106 carats. It was cut into nine large jewels and 96 smaller pieces. 
The largest one was purchased by South Africa's Transvaal government while it was under British rule. The 530 carat stone was then presented to King Edward VII in 1907 for his birthday, and the second largest stone, the smaller Star of Africa, was mounted in the imperial crown. Today, many South African people see the monarch's acquisition of the jewel as illegitimate and are calling for the British royal family to give it back to its home country. Their argument, which is held by many countries around the world, most countries around the world in fact, is that England has long benefited from the minerals of the South African country at the expense of their people. Number 6. Flags of Elizabeth II in 1960, Queen Elizabeth II adopted a flag to be flown on any building, ship, car, or aircraft in which she was staying or traveling in. There are many personal flags, but the Queen's own flag can only be flown by none other than herself unlike the royal standard, which represents the entirety of the United Kingdom. Her personal flag is quite a simple one. It consists of her initial E for Elizabeth, ensigned with the royal crown and surrounded by a chaplet of golden roses. Quite a feminine flag for the most powerful woman on the planet. The whole design is in gold or yellow on a royal blue field, and the flag must be fringed with gold as well. This flag was flown to mark her presence in non-monarchical Commonwealth countries and in kingdoms that didn't adopt a personal flag specifically for Her Majesty. Now, you won't ever see this flag being flown anymore, but back when she was still alive, to see this flag meant that she wasn't far away. Number 5. Westminster Abbey the Collegiate Church of St. Peter is a massive, prevailingly Gothic church in Westminster, London, located just to the west of the Palace of Westminster. It is neither a cathedral nor a parish church. The Abbey is a place of worship owned directly by the British royal family. Since William the Conqueror's Christmas Day coronation in 1066 in Westminster Abbey, almost all English monarchs have been crowned in this church. To this effect, St. Edward's Chair, which is the throne where the British sovereigns sit, is housed within the Abbey. This is also the resting place of many British kings and queens, and many other historically important figures, such as Charles Darwin, Catholic Bloody Mary, or Geoffrey Chaucer. The funeral of Queen Elizabeth II was also held at the Abbey. It was a historic event attended by thousands, including over 500 foreign dignitaries. She chose this venue herself, and she was the first sovereign's funeral to take place there in 262 years. In fact, it was also at the Abbey that she made married her beloved Prince Philip, and the myrtle used in the banquet on her coffin was grown from the same myrtle the Queen carried in her wedding bouquet in 1947. Number 4. 150,000 Works of Art the Queen's British Royal Art Collection didn't belong to the Queen as a private individual. She held it in trust as sovereign for her successors, her son, and the nation. It is organized and run by the Royal Collection Department, one of the sections of the Royal Household, and funded exclusively by the Royal Collection Trust, a registered charity chaired by the Prince of Wales. Queen Elizabeth II had arguably the finest art collection in the world. It's certainly one of the largest and most widely distributed art collections in the planet. Her collection of drawings by Leonardo and Michelangelo alone constitutes the largest collection of works by these Renaissance masters in the world. Started by King Charles I and then added to by the kings and queens of the British monarchy over 500 years, the royal collection comprises over 200,000 pieces of fine art, including some 7,000 paintings, 40,000 drawings and watercolors, 150,000 old prints, sculptures, ceramics, and rare illuminated manuscripts, as well as an extensive assortment of decorative art, including furniture, clocks, silver, jewelry, and tapestries. Works of art from the collection are on public display in various locations, such as the Queen's Gallery, Buckingham Palace, Clarence House, Hampton Court Palace, Windsor Castle, Frogmore House, and the Queen's Gallery, Palace of of Holyrood House. Other works are featured in several temporary exhibitions in the UK and overseas. Number 3. Queen Elizabeth II's Own Tartan the Queen took a yearly vacation from her royal duties from roughly August to October, and for the occasion, she often traveled to the Balmoral Castle in Scotland. 
During her holidays, she was often joined by other members of the royal family. The castle offers them some wanted privacy, but Elizabeth II was often spotted on her way to church on Sundays or enjoying the famous Bramer games. While on her Scottish escapades, the queen's wardrobe was usually a lot more relaxed. She swapped her neon bright coats for a more outdoorsy wear and tartan miniskirts. And, of course, she often wore her own official tartan. According to the Scottish Register of Tartans, the original Balmoral tartan, which is grey with black and red checks, was designed by Queen Victoria's husband in 1853. Today, it can only be worn by the monarch. Other members of the royal family can wear it, but only with the sovereign's permission. While she was alive, the only other approved wearer of the Balmoral tartan was the queen's personal piper and no one else. Traditionally, people used to wear the tartan which related to their family name or clan, but in recent years, it's become a popular fashion trend. Now, we don't know if Queen Elizabeth II was behind the fashion brand's new love for tartan, but who knows? Number 2. A Retail Empire did you know that the Queen, aside from being a crucially important figurehead for the UK and the Commonwealth during times of enormous societal change, also ran many businesses? It seems like she did it all. Great Britain is a land of business entrepreneurs, and the royal family is no exception. The Queen herself was an autonomous business entity with an impressive money-making stance. She held both private and trust properties and well-oiled businesses that pumped insane amounts of money to roll the wheels of the British royal royal system. And yeah, this may sound a little fishy. Why would a monarch use their position of power to make money at a private level? But if you think about it, a royal family that funds themselves is less money that the taxpayer has to pay. In fact, despite popular belief, due to such royal activities, the British taxpayer does not have to spend a fortune on providing for the lush and luxurious lifestyle of their royals. Not only that, but every royal has to pay taxes for the profit of their private businesses as individuals, like everyone else. Look, don't get me wrong, the taxpayer still pays for quite a bit, including their VIP security, but they do well on their own right as well. Number 1. $10 Million Car Collection Seeing as the Majesty was a driver mechanic in the Women's Auxiliary Territorial Service during the Second World War, it's safe to say that the former Queen of England not only was a car enthusiast, but also knew her way around cars. She was a woman of action, that's for sure. And Her Majesty's staggering $10 million car collection proves it. It was certainly the envy of any knowledgeable car enthusiast. Her collection included unique cars made just for her, such as her Rolls-Royce, Bentleys, and Jaguar models. While most of her fans know her as a passionate Land Rover Defender lover, Queen Elizabeth II also had many other magnificent vehicles, like the Daimler Super V8 LD WB for her personal use. Her eight-cylinder production car was the first ever that Rolls-Royce had ever built. When she was a princess, she ordered the first Phantom 4, chassis number A4F2. Also, the first ever manufactured Bentley Bentayga is also in the Monarch's collection. They actually built the opulent SUV to order just for her and following to the T her specifications. She loved this car in particular for her hunting trips, seen as it came with a twin twin turbocharged 6.0 liter W12 engine that generated 600 horsepower and 664 pound feet of torque. Queen Elizabeth II certainly left her mark on this world in more ways than one. What about you? Are you fond of the royals, or do you prefer a country without a monarchy? Tell us about it. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.